will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a legend, maybe you've heard before, there's a legend that dates back to the Middle Ages comes to us from the country of Germany, a legend about the Pied Piper of Hamlet. How many of you have heard of or are familiar with the Pied Piper of Hamlet? The legend goes that the Piper, who dressed in a very multicolored uh, outfit, hence the name Pied, was hired as a rat catcher. This uh, town had a major problem, a plague was going on. They hired this man as a rat catcher to lure the rats away with a magic pipe that he had. The piper did so. He lured all of the rats away from the town, but then the town didn't want to pay him. So what did the piper do? To get his revenge, he came back and he lured away all of the children of the town with his magic pipe. It gets a little dicey what happened after that. It doesn't get into a real friendly version. But you get the gist of the story. He lured the rats away. He did what he was supposed to do with his magic flute. They didn't pay him, so he lured away the children with his magic flute. But when we consider Jesus calling Peter and Andrew, calling James and John in our passage today, it, it almost seems there's a certain Pied Piper quality about him. You are a stranger, this odd man that comes to town and lures away very simple, hard-working fishermen. What was it that led these men to drop what they were doing and walk off? What would possess them to leave behind their work, their boats as a family business, father and mother and family? Well, there was no magic pipe involved in our story in Matthew. There was no song in the story as well. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. That's all he said. And Peter and Andrew followed. If you look at verse 21, where he addresses James and John, he simply called them. That's all it says. He just called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. There was nothing magical or compulsive. Peter and Andrew, James and John saw something in Jesus that spoke to them on a deeper level. If we dip into the Gospel of John, we see here where Jesus calls Peter and Andrew, James and John, this is not the first time that he saw Peter and Andrew, James and John. In John chapter 1, we learn how Andrew had been following John the Baptist. And through that, Andrew is exposed to Jesus. He sees him as something special because the one that he was following, John the Baptist, calls Jesus the Lamb of God. Now that's not something you do very lightly, is it? Andrew went and told Peter. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. That happened before we get to our story that we have here today. Now with the closeness of Peter and Andrew and James and John, they seem to have been a very close uh, companions here, it is very likely that Peter and Andrew at least told James and John about Jesus and maybe even brought James and John to see Jesus before we get to our story in Matthew's Gospel today. So when Jesus comes along and he calls, follow me, this isn't some stranger. This is a special person, full of promise. Something exciting is going on. Something, it seems, of God. Still, 
movement to drop what you are doing and follow as they did. To literally walk off like that. That is pretty astounding, isn't it? Can you imagine you're going about your normal activities, your normally daily routine, somebody comes and knocks on the door, Kurt, come follow me and I will help you mow grass for everyone in the world. <laughs> Can you imagine, just, just the, to come and, and, and you walk off, whatever it is that you were doing, you're gonna go and do it in the grandest way possible, affecting lives and minds and hearts of people everywhere. It's an astounding thing to think about it. When we consider what they did, how can we understand following Jesus? We say we follow Jesus today. We say the church follows Jesus today. But when we see what they did, how can we understand following Jesus? If we are to follow Jesus, must we, must we leave all behind? Or is there another way? The witness of the New Testament would suggest that Jesus had many followers, only a handful of which responded the way that Peter and Andrew, James and John, and the rest of the Twelve did. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, remember them? Mary and Martha and Lazarus were followers. Later on, Cornelius, a Roman centurion, was a follower. Simon called Peter in Joppa, not Simon Peter the disciple, Simon called Peter in Joppa, was a follower. In Philippi, Lydia from Thyatira, a merchant of purple cloth, was a follower. In Ephesus, Priscilla and Aquila, and so very many more were followers who never left home, who never left job, who never left their families, and yet they were followers who were remembered in Scripture and in many cases who were praised for the things that they did. What then does it mean to follow? The simplest way to put it that I can describe is that if you follow Jesus, that means Jesus is leading you. He is in charge. He directs everything, and you respond. It means that you have decided to submit your life to his direction, wanting what Jesus has to offer above all else that there is. In our text, Jesus directs Peter and Andrew, James and John. He directs them, and the result of that direction for them was a physical thing. It meant that they literally left home and job, family and friends. Honestly, not very many people seem to be called to that particular form of following. But here today, many of you do actually have some experience with this. How many here have ever gone, have ever gone on a mission trip? For a week or a weekend, I, there are many in this church who've gone on a mission trip. If you have only been a week, but you went, maybe you, you had to give up vacation to do so. You, you had to give up. You really had to leave behind all that you normally would do. You didn't see family or friends. You weren't doing your job. You, you, you have a little teeny tiny sense of what it means to pick up everything and, and follow, or just to leave everything and to follow. That, that kind of behavior is not normal, is it? There are people not of faith who might do such a thing too, but all in all, going, serving, often under less than normal or ideal conditions, that's something that comes from a spiritual or a divine place. It isn't the normal human response. Now, before you pull a muscle, patting yourself on the back, understand, following Jesus Following Jesus isn't something you can reduce to a week of your time or even a week a year. That's not going to make you a follower if that's the extent of your following. Following Jesus is full time. But hopefully this little illustration can give some of you a, a little bit of perspective about what it means to follow and to simply do what others or what Jesus is directing you to do. You're not in charge. You go and do as you are told. Following Jesus 
It's not like following someone on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or what other form of social media that you might like to look at from time, uh, 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 time to time. There, when you're following someone, you're an occasional. As you desire to tune in, watcher of other people. You're a watcher of other things. Following Jesus is an active thing. Following Jesus changes what we do. It changes how we behave. It changes how we act. Now looking at Peter and Andrew, James and John, there are a couple principles that I hope you would understand. Whether we are follow, or whether we are called to follow in place or literally to go. First thing is something I've kind of already alluded to. We follow and Jesus directs. To follow Jesus means Jesus sets the agenda. He sets the whole agenda. Maybe you've been to some kind of conference or you've been to some kind of special day uh, work or, 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 or some other situation where you have a prescribed schedule, but then there's a little bit of free time to do what you want. Maybe you're on a vacation, you're on a cruise, and we have these activities, but here's free time, and you can go do what you want. Following Jesus doesn't give you free time. Follow Jesus means Jesus is directing what you would do and how you would do it all of the time, all of the time. You already... We, we, excuse me. He's, he tells us what to do and we do it his way. There are so many, there are so many who want so badly all that Jesus has to offer. They want the forgiveness of sins. They want the peace. They want the new life. They want everlasting life, but they want it on their terms. They want to be able to, they want to be able to tune in here, dip in there, and, and just get what they need, get what they want, when they want, how they want. That's not the way it works. If you would have all that Jesus offers, you must do things on Jesus' terms, as he directs. He sets the direction. He sets the rules. How many of you remember, I remember years ago, McDonald's had this little promotion, a monopoly promotion. And you go in, you buy certain items, and they have a little sticker, you peel off, and there's a monopoly piece. How many of you remember that? Was kids, we thought that was such a big deal. We wanted to, we were sure we were going to win the big prize. We only went to McDonald's like once every six months, but we were sure we would collect enough of those pieces and win something big. You, you buy certain items, you peel off the little tiny piece, and then if you had three purples, um, or if you had the three reds, or if you had the, the boardwalk and park place, or if you had the railroads, you'd win some amazing prizes. But you had to have the correct set. It didn't matter. You, you could buy as much as you wanted to buy. You could collect all the little uh, stamps that you could possibly get your hand in. But, but if you went and you just handed in a handful of stamps and it looked like a rainbow that you're handed to them, they're not even going to laugh at you because that's not the way it worked. You can say, but I've got a hundred stamps. It doesn't matter. You have to have the three right stamps or it doesn't work. You don't get the prize. When it comes to following Jesus, we can do all kinds of things seemingly thinking we're on the right track or saying we're on the right track or wanting to believe we're on the right track, but unless we're doing it Jesus' way, we're not following. You must follow, which means let Jesus lead. Let Jesus direct you. Do what he tells you to do, or really nothing is going to come of all your efforts. The other principle that I want to point out today from our text, another tough one, is Jesus comes first. Say that with me. Jesus comes first. That is a tough one. Jesus comes before anything else. Peter and Andrew, James and John, we, we've seen, they left. They literally left job and home and family to follow. Again, you may not be called to leave, but when following Jesus comes into conflict with job or home or family, there is no decision to be made. Not if you are following Jesus. If we are following Jesus and Jesus comes into conflict with job or family or home or friends, 
Jesus wins. We don't even have to think about it. Jesus comes first before anything else. We do as Jesus directs, despite job and family and friends or anything else. Sure, there may be consequences, but really there are consequences to everything that we do in every aspect of our life. There always are consequences. Some just don't seem very big that we bother with them. Some may not be very noticeable at all. Some consequences we might think are pleasant in the short run or in the long run. For some reason or another, we might decide that we can live with the consequences that come from particular action that we take. There's always consequences. Following Jesus isn't about our comfort. It's not about our convenience. It is about following the one who stirs us deep down, which is way better, whose way is way better than the way of the world. It's about following the one whose way is truth and love, who means for us to be blessed, not for a moment, but for all of eternity. In the end, I don't think that it's really all that remarkable that Peter and Andrew, James and John, did follow Jesus the way that they did, except that they were the first. Really, it's more remarkable today that so many won't and don't follow Jesus. All that God has to offer through Jesus, why wouldn't everybody follow? That is the tragedy, that's what's remarkable. With all that God offers, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? The other piece that's so very, very sad is to consider how poorly so many who say they follow Jesus seem to follow him when so much is a stake. Here today, I pray that the Spirit in you responds to the Spirit calling you, that you will hear, that you will see, that you will say yes to Jesus in word and deed, that you will step out in faith to go, to do, to be whatever Jesus is calling you to. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your son Jesus, for the life he lived, for the sacrifice he made, for the life that is possible for us. We praise you that he still calls followers today.